Hello, my name is Shai Moran. I'm a faculty member here at the Technion, at the Mathematics Department and at the Computer Science Department. My main field of study is uh, theoretical computer science and discrete mathematics. Today I'll be joining Elia Turner for a conversation about my research. Elia is a PhD student at the Math Department and I hope you'll join us and enjoy. Hi Shai, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Can you tell me a bit about your personal life? Sure, yes. So um, I was born not far from here in uh, Kibbutz Yagur. I'm a third generation there. I still live there with uh, my family. I'm married to Caroline and we have uh, three children, Alon, Ella and Anne. And um, yes, we're very happy to live there. It's close to the techno, it's very convenient. Okay. So let's move on to your research. What is it about? I study theoretical computer science and uh, discrete mathematics. And I mostly focus on uh, learning theory, which is the mathematical theory that aims to explain machine learning, namely how computer algorithms learn. Right, so as you probably know, uh, machine learning is a, is a field, is a technology that has been revolutionizing uh, our world in the last decades. You know, now we have autonomous driving cars, uh, we have language models that can almost simulate uh, human beings. So it's really a, uh, an exciting field and I focus on the theoretical, mathematical part of, uh, of this area. And do you feel that the theory of machine learning can explain the success of these modern algorithms? Right, so this is an, an excellent question and in fact the an the, currently the answer is not really. So uh, the, there is a clean, beautiful, classical mathematical theory of learning, but this theory misses a lot. It does not explain the, uh, the modern success or the phenomena that we see in modern machine learning. So this really inspires my research, this, this gap between, between theoretical machine learning and practical machine learning. Okay, so perhaps you can give me an example of a classical theory or a influential theory or a result in your field? Happily, so uh, let, let, me, let me describe a result in the, in the traditional machine learning theory, which is called PAC, probably approximately correct learning. So this result addresses classification tasks. So let's, let's think about an example together. So you can imagine that we want to train the computer to classify images of cats from images of dogs. Okay, so how, does, how will we do it? So we will take one of the machine learning algorithms, then we will feed it with lots and lots of images, of labeled examples, images of cats and dogs. And on each image in the training set, we will tell the algorithm, this is an image of a cat, or this is an image of a dog. Then the algorithm will work its magic, and at the end of the day, it will give us a predictor that even if we give it a new example, a new image, which is either of a cat or a dog, that it hasn't seen before, we expect it, or, and it will succeed, to classify correctly whether the image is of a cat or a dog. So these are classification tasks. So that, what you described is a classification task, and the property that you desire is the ability to generalize to unseen data. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and the theorem I want to describe concerns a mathematical model where such tasks are defined. And furthermore, there is a mathematical definition to when a classification task is learnable. When does there exist an algorithm that is able to predict well, given enough examples? So this theorem is called the fundamental theorem of back learning. It was discovered both in the East and in the West 50 years ago. And uh, the beautiful uh, thing about this theorem is that it boils this relatively complex mathematical definition of learnability to a simple, simply to define combinatorial parameter, VC dimension. So to every learning task, it assigns a number, and this number measures the complexity of the learning task. If this number is small, the task is easy. If this number is large, the task is harder. And furthermore, this number also determines how many, like the, the, the success rate of the algorithm given uh, n examples as a function of number of examples. So what does this number depend on? On the task, right? So we didn't say exactly what a learning task, we didn't define it mathematically, but there is a mathematical definition of what is a learning task, and this number is, is a function of, the, of this task. So saying, given the complexity of the problem, there is a mapping from a problem to a combinatorical number that determines how 
hard it would be to learn that problem. Exactly. So, uh, where do you come in? Uh, okay, so, uh, so as I said, uh, modern machine learning presents many, many more new challenges. So, for example, uh, privacy is an issue, right? So you can imagine that modern learning algorithms, they train on, uh, on private data, on personal data that might be private, and uh, uh, we want that the algorithms will protect the privacy of the data, right? So if we, if we in medical applications, you can imagine that uh, we can train uh, an algorithm on medical data of patients. A really important concern is that the data will not be leaked as a result of the training process of, the, of, of, this, of this machine learning. In our work, we characterized statistically which tasks can be learned by an algorithm that protects the privacy. And here we also gave uh, such a combinatorial dimension that characterizes the complexity of the problem. So if I understand correctly, we started from the classical theory of learning, and then you extend that theorem to the, so that it can be applied to many modern applications, and one such application is privacy. So you derive a mathematical formula of what is privacy, and then you show uh, how you can find a variant of the VC dimension and then apply the same original theory. Right, right. So, yeah, so the mathematical, by the way, the mathematical definition of privacy is, is not ours. This is something standard, which is used also in, in, in industry, for instance. But we use this definition and we were able to answer when can a learning task be solved by an algorithm that is private, that uh, satisfies, protects privacy? Do you have any other example? In another example, we consider the interactive machine learning, right? So these are learning talk contexts in which the algorithm can interact with the user in more interesting ways. So for instance, imagine a, a recommendation system for restaurants that you might have on your iPhone, such as Yelp. And you can imagine that uh, you know this recommendation system is supposed to recommend restaurants as you say arrive to a new city, and it can interact with you, right? It can ask you, did you like a certain restaurant that you visited, or maybe it can even ask you, okay, I saw that you visited these two restaurants, restaurant A and restaurant B, which one did you like better? And it is very intuitive that this kind of interaction can really enhance and accelerate the learning process. The, uh, the algorithm will be uh, able to give you better recommendations uh, on, based on this information. So even here, there is a definition of interactive machine learning. And again, it's a mathematical definition, and you can ask which learning tasks can be learned interactively. And also here, we identify the uh, dimension, a mathematical parameter that, that uh, captures this. And one, one actually nice thing I want to mention about all of these works is that uh, from a technical perspective, uh, they reveal surprising and deep connections with other fields of mathematics. So for example, the private uh, machine learning, we found there really surprising connections and deep connections with model theory and logic, which at first sight seems to be at the other side of the mathematical spectrum, right? Machine learning is here, <laughs> model theory, might be on the extreme other side. And in the interactive learning uh, work, we, um, we used the techniques we developed there to solve a long-standing open question in complexity theory. So there are really exciting connections. So it sounds like even though you are under the umbrella of learning theory and the learning field, your daily life involves working and thinking about many different mathematical fields, which sound, sounds like fun. Yeah, absolutely. And this is what I actually enjoy most, these, these new surprising connections. And once we found these connections, I get to learn about some other mathematical fields I, I wasn't aware of before. And uh, it's, really, it's really great to always learn new things. OK, so perhaps we can move to a less serious topic. Can you tell me about your favorite mathematical anecdote? Um, yes, so um, there is one uh, nice anecdote I heard from uh, Noga Alon, and this is, so, so this is a true story. And it's also related to a mathematical theorem that I've been using a lot. It's about a Hungarian sociologist, and he examined friendships among groups of children. And he observed the following phenomena. Whenever he took about 20 kids where he was living, he could always either find among them four kids, each two of which are friends, or four kids, each two of which are not friends. 
And, you know, and he asked myself, is there something sociological going on here? If I'll do the same experiment in India, I'll take 20 Indian kids, will I get the same number four? Is, is there, or maybe this number four is uh, something special about Hungary or about my hometown? What do you think? What do you think is the... Like, I'm trying to run in my head uh, an example of 20 kids and all the possible combinations of four of them. And to be honest, I don't know. What is it? So indeed, there is nothing sociological about this number four. And uh, Sando Tzalai, this Hungarian sociologist, found it. By, so he, he went to his friend Paul Erdos, who is a famous mathematician, and he asked him. And Paul Erdos told him that indeed, this observation that he saw is a corollary of a famous theorem called Ramsey theorem, which exactly tells you that such, such statements. <laughs> so let me ask you one last thing. What advice would you give to a younger self or to a beginner graduate student like myself? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so I think the advice or a kind of what I even follow these days is uh, to follow your heart, right? So if, for example, if you find a mathematical problem that excites you, that you know, you walk on the beach and spontaneously you find yourself th thinking about this problem, then this is an excellent uh, signal that this can become a good research project. So really follow your heart. If something excites you and interests you, work on this. Don't let the buzz confuse you. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Shai, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Elia, for your time. And I was happy discussing this with you.